Daniel Ketchum. I'm the president of the Nevada County Historical Society. I have the privilege of serving in this position for a couple of years. Welcome, everybody. We actually anticipated a fairly small crowd tonight because of the weather, but you're all brave. So it's a good way to start the new year. We have 11 presentations this year. We meet every month except December. Uh, if you're a newcomer tonight, raise your hand. Wow. Thanks for coming. Thanks for joining us. That's free, and we have refreshments afterwards. Can't beat that. <laughs> so, um, how many people are from Pasadena or Altadena area? I mean, watch the Rose Parade every year on TV. My, my family hails from Al uh, Altadena and La Cunada, so kind of watching the Rose Parade is embedded to me. But this year, I feel like I got cheated. How about yeah. you in that? Yeah. I wake yeah. up at night thinking, what do those last two floats look like? Yeah. So, yes. Not a good way to start the new year off. <laughs> So we have a few announcements before we get in the program. Um, let's just start with uh, Pat from Cyril's and any announcements from Cyril's, Pat? Uh, we're still working at <laughs> uh, getting a lot of more uh, items cataloged. We have a new collection in today from a daughter of a lady who passed away. We'll work on that. And we could really use a volunteer that was interested in coming in on Wednesdays. Uh, it's our shortest day for volunteers. Um, we can find something for you to do if you like to do computer work. We got that. If not, we'll find something else. But um, it's just short-handed right now. And Pat, where is the Cyril's Historical Research Library located <laughs> in relation to ship where we are tonight? Some Across people may not know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big building right next door. <laughs> yeah, we've got 60 parking spaces and it's flat land and. Heated, air conditioned, and good lighting. Much different than the old building. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Pat. Madeline, the Railroad Museum. We're busy as usual. And um, for uh, 2018, we have these wonderful volunteers who put in 15,000 hours wow. for us. And um, our Santa, it, you know, Dece uh, December's Santa Claus Day brought in uh, 855 people. Uh, we you know we have the rail bus, which is so popular. And this uh, past uh, year, of course it doesn't operate in the winter, uh, we had 4,332 passengers. So if you haven't had a rail bus ride, uh, check us out. We start officially in May. But call us if you want to ride because we get booked up. <laughs> and uh, we're starting a big project um, with our beloved movie star, Engine Number no. 5. It's uh, going in for lots of renovation, and someday it will run. <laughs> and we have a passenger car, too, that we're starting to work on. So we have a good time while we're doing all this. Thank you, Madeline. Uh, Randy Smith from the Railroad Museum. Um, we're having a buy a tie program. I put uh, forms out there, $30. You get a frameable uh, certificate with your name on it, or if you want to do like this one's in memory mm -hmm. of Elmer Gray, um, you can do that. Uh, they're all numbered, and then we'll give you a map, and then we'll put a little dot on there where your tie is. And so far we've gotten 39. Uh, we're looking for a lot more because we need to replace a lot of ties. They're really kind of shaky. But anyhow, uh, we appreciate everything. You know, the kids love it, so do it for you. <laughs> now, if I were to come over and ride the rail bus, which I've done a few times, and it's great, are those shaky ties on that track? <laughs> Yeah, some of them are. <laughs> please, please donate new ties. It's a wonderful ride. Uh, how about uh, Kathy from the firehouse? Anything to report? Hi. Well, we're uh, close for the season, but we had a really exciting day at Firehouse Museum today. Um, unfortunately, our visitors were from the Sheriff's Department and Police Department <laughs> because with the power outages and the big storm, the alarm system was just going nuts. But when I was last there at five o'clock, it was all good, well and good. So um, we are trying to accommodate special tours during the winter, depending on which projects we're working on. So um, if you want to, if you have 
guests coming from out of town or whatever, uh, give me a call. And uh, Priscilla and I did a special tour for um, a group that came up from the Bay Area, 34 people, and uh, then we got eight walk-ins while we were doing the tour. So uh, we'd love to have you come down. If we can accommodate it, depending on this, you know, this is the time that we work on our exhibits. So, so that's it. The firehouse is closed in the wintertime, as is the mining museum. Uh, any representatives from the mining museum here tonight? Um, so we uh, want to thank Barbara Jensen and Kathy for our cookie refreshments tonight. And Carolyn Jones Rogers is working out in the lobby, provided our, our raffle gift basket tonight, so we appreciate that. Uh, we do need some help. Uh, we need volunteers to help us set up and take down here at Speaker Night. Um, our our long-standing membership chair, Wayne T, retired on December 31st, and he used to kind of staff that table for us. So we're looking for a volunteer that perhaps could. Uh, arrive every month a little bit early and help us uh, staff the check-in table. So if that if it is of interest to you, <coughs> talk to me after the meeting. Um, let's see, what else? Any other announcements besides Linda Jack is next. Hi. Um, for those of you who attend the, our, either of our, or both of our World War I lectures, uh, I have talked about local history back in October, and Marlon Harnani has talked about uh, World War I in the Middle East in November. Part of our uh, grant of Cal Humanities is to fill out their questionnaires. <laughs> so if you attended one or both of those, uh, and I can already, already pounce on you, um, they'll be right up here. And you can, there are only seven questions. It looks like a lot more than it is. Um, but we we'll definitely want to apply for grants in the future. So uh, to get these filled out is really helpful. So they'll be right up here. And maybe while you're having your cookies, you can just fill them out and leave them in the basket. Thank so we were very privileged to get that grant. Linda worked hard to get that and use the funds wisely. So we do want to try to respond to their question, your oh. need, if at all possible. Sorry, I'll just say the, the white one is the talk that I gave. And the kind of yellow one is the Middle East talk. So they're the same question. And we do need some more cookie volunteer sign-ups, uh, so I'm going to pass this around if you feel so inspired, uh, even later in the year. Uh, please give me your name and phone number, and we would greatly appreciate help with cookies. Uh, coming up uh, this year, we have, uh, who knows Chris Inns? Everybody knows Chris Inns, writer Chris Inns, comedian. Uh, she's going to be in February uh, talking about Cowboys, Creatures, and Classics, the story of Republic Pictures, and she's always highly entertaining, highly suggest you be here. Uh, March, we have a rather interesting one, and perhaps you read about this in the newspaper, because that's where we got his idea. I did a contact him at Dan Baldwin, who's been doing Civil War Cemetery research and headstone restoration. He's going to be here to tell us about that project and, and share with us his trials and tribulations of that. So, And then in uh, April, we have Mark Silverstein. Chris, are you going to be assisting in that presentation as well? I'll have you down here, but Mark and Chris are going to be talking about uh, Native American history at Malakoff. Is that correct? That's right. I've got the project that's on going up there with that. Uh, Native American neighborhood actually on the coast <coughs> of North Bloomfield. So we are bringing that to light and we're learning more about it all the time. So we're going to share that. Excellent. So that's coming up. Uh, we do have lots of blanks after that. In fact, we have nothing else for the year. So if you have speaker ideas, please contact me. I, I would run with any uh, presenter ideas. I'm glad to contact and recruit anybody I possibly can. With that being said, uh, Gage McKinney is our presenter tonight. I suspect a few of you have probably heard Gage present before. How many of you took his class recently at Zero College? I thought some of you, you couldn't get enough but came back for more. So Gage is our, one of our local historians, obviously uh, well-versed in Cornish Miners. A uh, member of the Historical Society team, and he's presented here before. We're very pleased to have you tonight. All Thank you, Dan. <laughs> so this is a sound check. Can you hear all right? Okay. Can hear? All right. So on the screen behind me, we have some uh, Cornish miners. The one in the uh, upper left is in. Uh, Bendigo, uh, Victoria, Australia, a statue. Beside him is Matt Kerno, who is in South Australia. And uh, uh, the other fellow, um, he just looks so likely, I just had to use the photograph. <laughs> and uh, the man on the top right there is our own uh, cousin Jack from the Empire Mines. And, uh, then, well, we had to have a miner eating a pasty. It, it, couldn't, be a, it couldn't be a Cornish miner without it. So, how many people here are 
Cornish Cornish descendants. Really? See, so so I thought you all were. <laughs> Oh. My wife tells me that I have a button dangling. Is that, is that, is that distracting? <laughs> Maybe that's why the lights went down. So I thought that you, you were all Cornish uh, because of the weather outside. Uh, beautiful Cornish evening. And uh, as uh, John Wesley used to say, um, the, the Cornish will no more disperse in the rain than will a troop of soldiers, uh, because they would, he, he, he would preach, and he could go on a while, and there would often be a rainstorm in the midst of it, and they would all hang in there for it. So thanks so much for uh, coming out and acting like Cornish people. So, just want to start with the basics. Uh, what is Cornwall and where is it? And so, so it's the southwesternmost corner of the United Kingdom. Uh, probably best you don't say England, you say United Kingdom, because Cornwall is a Celtic land uh, in and of itself. Uh, historically, it's also a royal duchy. The uh, Duke of uh, the the firstborn son of the sovereign in England at birth becomes the Duke of Cornwall. It's only later that he's made the Prince of Wales. But at birth, he's, he's the Duke of Cornwall and has been since about 1350. And then administratively, Cornwall is a county of England. So it's larger than Nevada County, smaller than Placer County, I guess over here, just about the same size as Santa Clara County, where San Jose is the county seat. And um, of course, we have 50 counties in this state. So that sort of gives you an idea of its size. California is almost identical in size. It might be just a little bit larger than the entire United Kingdom, including England, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, Cornwall. Um, and so, Cornwall is the size of one of our one of our 50 counties and yet it sent a tremendous number of people uh, probably a third of its population uh, overseas and we will get to that <coughs> so when Dan asked me to come tonight I it was a little bit late in late in the schedule, and and uh, I think he wanted to make sure he would get me. So um, he proposed a topic he knew I couldn't refuse, uh, which was the Cornish Minor. So this is a this is a little segment uh, from the class that I taught at C Sierra College on uh, Cornish history and culture. But for those of you who took the class, I think you're going to learn something a little different tonight uh, from what we learned uh, in the class. And so two of my heroes have written books with Cornish Minor in the name. Actually three of them now that I think of it, but two, two are pertinent tonight. Um, uh, A.K. Hamilton Jenkins, who was a Redwood man who went to Oxford and came back and wrote Cornish history in the early 20th century. And then uh, our good friend um, Cecil Todd, who we knew as Toddy, who wrote the book The Cornish Miner in America, which is being raffled off tonight. The highly prized second edition with that second uh, preface uh, by, by Toddy, talking a lot about, about California. So there's a lot of knowledgeable people here. And I'd like to ask you what you know about Cornish miners. So when I say the Cornish miner, what what comes comes to mind? Pasties. Pasties <laughs> come to mind. And we had one represented just just a moment ago. Good sense of humor. 
good good observation. Good <laughs> good sense of humor. Tin mining. Tin mining. Tin mining. Tommy knockers, which are the elves underground. Cornish pump. The Cornish pump, part of the technology. Music. Music. The Cornish carol choir, wonderful singing voices. I'm glad you said that. George says wherever there's a hole in the ground, there's a Cornish miner at the bottom. Strong work ethic. Yeah. Good work ethic. Strong sense of community. Strong sense of community. And Orlo's personal favorite, I think, a nose for gold. <laughs> right? And so a lot of what we know about the Cornish miner, uh, such as uh, a hole in the ground isn't, isn't a mine unless there's a Cornishman down there and a nose for gold and so forth. Um, are things that you can't really document and and point to uh, how that created a, co a competent miner. And a lot of the talk about Cornish miners, not as came up in, in the last couple of minutes, but as you may have heard over the course of time, has a lot to do with them just having mining in their blood, sort of being natural miners because their people had been doing it so long. In the 19th century, there was a lot of talk like that, that somehow there is some kind of biological connection, something in the blood that made the Cornish miner. Now, in our time, we know that's all a lot of baloney uh, because um, there's a separation between biology and culture, and the two shouldn't get muddled together. And, um, uh, and so what I want to try to do tonight is um, expunge all of the, uh, the talk that, that the Cornish really promoted themselves about how they were natural miners. Um, <coughs> And it's all what my friend Philip Payton, and this is Professor Philip in a typical pose, um, uh, what he calls the myth of Cousin Jack. So notions that they're somehow natural miners, that it was in their blood, that every mine had a Cornishman at the bottom and so forth, that had an economic value to it. And that's how Philip Philip talks about the myth of Cousin Jack. Um, this notion that Cornish people were somehow superior miners uh, just because they walked into your mining camp uh, served the Cornish really well. And when they would encourage other Cornishmen to come over, um, it helped them get their friends and relatives employed. It helped them climb up the ladder to become uh, shift bosses or mill foremen or superintendent, and mining engineers. So there was an economic impulse behind it. No doubt many of them actually believed it. But what I want to do tonight is move beyond the myth of Cousin Jack and talk about the uh, specific activities and training and cultural attributes that made the Cornish miner the guy that he was. And so I have discovered all history starts with geology. And if you want to tell the history of Nevada County, you really ought to start with the rocks. Well, we won't tell that tonight, but the history of Cornwall is uh, tectonic plates uh, collided in um, the um, uh, English Channel and uh, pushed up land masses. And then in those red spots up there was this granite intrusion. And so this is Cornwall. There's, uh, I think, six red, big red spots up there. 
and those were the mineralized zone. That granite uh, pushed up, created uh, uh, fissures, and then the hot molten minerals came up. The earth faulted in the process, uh, the process continued. And so that created the, uh, the, mineral, uh, the mineralized region of Cornwall. And then if you can see the numbers, number six, that's actually just over the Tamer River in um, Devon. And that is today the Dartmoor National Park, uh, which is maybe the first, one of the first uh, British uh, parks uh, modeled after our uh, national parks. <clears throat> National parks. And so, because of this, these valuable uh, minerals that were uh, in, implanted in, into those granite uh, upcroppings, um, let me just go back and say that the Cornish were mining tin in ancient times. They were supplying tin to the Phoenicians. Uh, they were the major source of tin for the Roman Empire. The, uh, the Romans had uh, 5,000 men, a full legion, and, and their families and appendages in Exeter, which is just to the right of that number six up there on the map. The reason they, they were there was to keep an eye on the Cornish tin mines and make sure that that tin was, was shipping regularly. And um, then it became uh, a cradle of the Industrial Revolution. And so to quote uh, Philip Payton again, the Cornish economy was one of the first in the world to industrialize the early and successful application of steam power facilitating the development of deep mining and achieving for Cornwall an envied place in the forefront of technological innovation. And just for the cosmopolitan audience that I know I have here today, uh, we leave the British spelling in uh, to uh, give you the full flavor. So it was tin originally the original mining in ancient times was what the Cornish called tin, tin streaming, but it's like our placer mining. It's working the streams. And by the, the uh, probably by the reign of uh, King Henry VII, um, which began in 1485, uh, the Cornish were involved in hard rock mining in actually digging in into to the earth. And by the reign of uh, uh, Henry's granddaughter, he, uh, Elizabeth I, they were doing systematic uh, scientific mining underground, um, uh, uh, excavating t chambers and timbering them and, and driving further. And they had some help from uh, German engineers who uh, Queen Elizabeth uh, brought over from uh, Freiburg in, in uh, Germany. So it was originally tin, and in the mist, in the bottom of the tin mines, they discovered <coughs> copper. And then that Cornwall and East Devon were one of the richest <coughs> copper fields in the world. Mm -hmm. And so copper really became the metal that drove the Industrial Revolution in Cornwall. Tin mines were, were, were still aft, active, but copper was king. And this is the parish of, of uh, uh, Gwenop. Uh, this is a tin workings that has collapsed. There is a Cornish uh, uh, engine house out on a bluff. And just the one parish of Gwenop so that would be like saying just Grass Valley. Just one parish produced a third of the copper in the world in 1824. So that just gives you an idea how much copper Cornwall was producing. And so the um, Mining Journal of London 
said from this point, uh, from Carnbury Hill, above my ancestral town of uh, uh, Red Ruth, was the most glorious site in mining in, in the world because you could look out from there and in any direction just see copper mines working. And uh, well, what would a Cornish presentation be like without Ross Poldar? <laughs> and so he's uh, represented, and of course Ross was deeply infested in copper mines. Um, in the last episode, or a few episodes ago, he was investing in uh, the uh, Wheel Rose, uh, which is uh, still an identified mine, not working, but still identified in, in Cornwall. And, uh, and so the expansion of copper started from West Cornwall, from out St. Just, which is out by Land's End, from uh, my ancestral town, Redruth, Camborne nearby, and, it, and they worked their way, way east into Devon and over to the Tamer River Valley. The Tamer River divides Cornwall from England, Cornwall from Devon, and that uh, river valley was a rich source of copper. And so by the 1700s, by the time the story of Ross Poldark starts, which is just after the American Revolution, um, the Cornish have solved all the important problems of mining at depth. And that is, they have figured out how to dewater, how to ventilate, uh, they, they figured out blasting in hard rock, uh, timbering, and hoisting the ore, and also getting the men down there efficiently to work the ore. And so, and, and so they started going down, um, not as deep as our mines, but thousands of feet. Some of the mines actually going under the Atlantic Ocean. And so they did it with high pressure steam engines, with Cornish pumps, Man engines were, were before men went down in skips, like we're acquainted with. They went down on kind of moving ladders, and, and you, you'd latch onto one and ride down to a level and get off and get onto another and ride down. <laughs> moving ladders. And uh, they invented the safety fuse, um, uh, crushing machineries, the, the uh, predecessor of our Cornish stamps, uh, railroads underground, safety lamps. Uh, mining tools. When Herbert Hoover came here and they had a big luncheon for him at the Bret Hart, the Cornish miners stood up and said, Mr. President, what's the difference between a gad and a goad? <laughs> and Herbert Hoover knew because he worked in a mine here in uh, uh, Nevada City. And, and there are implements that either push or pull rocks. And, uh, and then they invented, the Cornish invented the mining vocabulary. And so some of these words, like um, added and uh, wens and wheel and kibble and different words, are words out of the old Cornish language. Others are English words, but the way the Cornish use them, like say level and rising and sinking, and uh, uh, is the way that mining people began using them all over the world. And so. The Cornish mining vocabulary became the global mining vocabulary. So just when a Cornishman walks into a gold camp here, he's al already got the vocabulary down. And uh, he probably had a lot of the skills down as well. And so in the Cornish course, we talked a lot about the culture and an element of the culture that's hard to overemphasize is the arrival of John and Charles Wesley and the Methodist movement in the 1700s in Cornwall. And so it, it really shaped the culture. Someone said, when you think about the Cornish Cornish music, well, that was the Methodist hymn music as well as the music of Handel that shaped that. Uh, as far as mining, the Methodist movement had this tremendous sense of work ethic. Now, if you're a Catholic 
and you want to know what you believe, you can read the catechism. If you're uh, Church of England or Episcopalian, you can read the prayer book. If you're a Methodist, just sing the hymns. The catechism is in the hymns. And Char um, Charles, Charles Wesley wrote something like 7,000 of them, and including uh, a charge to keep I have, and forth in thy name, O Lord, I go, which are work songs, and which say, I am going to go forth and pursue my humble labors in the name of the Lord. And so even Methodism played into creating this person that is, that is the Cornish miner. Now, regrettably, sorry to tell you this, wasn't all Cornish people involved. Um, there were some Englishmen, and uh, even more importantly, some Scotsmen. And so James Watt, with his steam engine, and his partner, Matthew uh, Boynton, um, they were actually lived in Cornwall for many years. Uh, William uh, Murdoch became their agent, and he lived in Cornwall for a long time. Uh, lived in a house in uh, in uh, Red Roof, and then uh, John Taylor from Norfolk uh, became the most prominent mine captain and what they call adventurers in Cornwall. That is investor, and he was a big part of this eastern movement chasing the copper into Devon and then he uh, was a man who could raise capital in in the city of London and so he had mining interests all over England and Isle of Man and Ireland uh, he was a, a great a mining entrepreneur and also a man who wrote very intelligently and insightfully um, about the Cornish. So, so the Cornish had some help <coughs> becoming uh, what we know as the Cornish miner, but true to their Methodist heritage, uh, they had a lot of self-help too. And so this engineer in the far left is Richard Trevithick, and he is a great Cornish engineer. He just represent representative of a whole class of men. Uh, who got some fundamental scientific education and could apply it. And uh, Richard Trevithick invented high-pressure steam, which took the steam engine just to another, another dimension. Uh, I mean, it was like going from whatever the original apple was to whatever we have today. Um, and. Uh, and so he invented the first automobile. And it ran on steam. And as the folk song goes, um, on Christmas Day, 1803, he ran it up Camborn Hill. So going up Camborn Hill, coming down, the horses stood still, the wheels went around. Going up Camborn Hill, coming down. So he was indicative of the kind of <coughs> technical know-how that the Cornish acquired and that they could apply to their mining interests. And so, how did this, the inventiveness, the steam engine, high-pressured steam, the uh, engineers, superstars like Richard Trevithick, how did this all filter down to the working person? Well, in Cornwall, they developed, and it probably started <coughs> as early as the reign of Queen Elizabeth, which ended in 1603. They did, developed a unique system of labor contracting. And so they either were performing tuck work, which was a contract where you would do a particular volume of work and you'd be paid for the, for the rate of work that you had achieved. Uh, or they were working on tribute 
which means they were working a stope, a, a, a rich vein, and they were trying to bring out as much valuable metal as they could, as efficiently as they could, in as short a time as they could, and they got a percentage of the take. In the 1700s and the 1800s, you can hardly find anything about people working for wages in Cornwall and not working for wages in the mine. They were either doing tut work or they were doing tribute work. And those, that was, was the wage system. And so this is how it worked. The captain, or the captains, were the guys who ran the mine. They were the superintendents. Um, they were the Ross Poldark. Ross Poldark's a mine captain. Uh, he happens to also usually own his, he, well, one of his ventures he owns. Typically, captains would be leasing the mine from the Lord who owned it, and then they would be contracting with laborers to work it and trying to get some capital from other investors, which they called adventurers. So the captains would identify the work and define what the work would be, what shafts are going to be dug, or what uh, veins are going to be tapped. And they would do this usually in consultation with the men, or at least with the most skilled and most experienced of the men who knew the mine. And so the work would be defined, and then the miners on a given day, on, on the setting day, uh, would meet at the counting house. If you've been to the Empire Mine office, it's got this stairway in front where the men li lined up to, to uh, wrestle for, for jobs. Well, that would be a counting house at the mine office or, or some suitable place. And the uh, captains would read the general articles. That's kind of the rules of the mine and then what the pitches were that they were offering. Now the pitches is the identified work that they're offering to the men. And then uh, a pitch with typical tick typically be offered to the miners who were the incumbents, who were already working it. They were the takers. And they worked, they probably had a captain leading them, but they worked as a par, Cornish word, par. So a par was a team. And it could be as few as two miners, but it was most typically four to six miners with a couple of boys to help them. Boys went into the mine at the age of 10. And they weren't, a full, they weren't a full miner until they were probably 17 or 18. So a par, uh, four, five, six men, a 10-year-old boy, a 15-year-old boy, that'd be a pretty typical team. And so if the taker did not want the pitcher at the price offered, uh, which may have been a low price, then they could all bid on it. And it was a Dutch auction, so the lowest bidder won. Although the captain usually had a ceiling in mind, he didn't want it to go too low. It was not in his interest uh, to starve his workers. So he didn't want it too low, and, uh, and so they would have this auction. And so, when they got to, the, to maybe ready for the final bid or everyone to make their best and final offer, there was no gavel involved. The captain would throw a peb pebble in the air, and when it hit the ground, the bidding was closed. And the lowest bidder got the pitch. And so that's how it worked. And the expression was, the work was knocked down. The work is knocked down to Virgil Angove and his par. Something like that. And so the obligation of the par, uh, if they're doing tut work, 
It was usually defined in so many feet of excavation. So if they had to drive, drive a level, say, seven feet square, uh, and the typical pitch was 100 and 150 feet long, something in that neighborhood. It depended upon how hard the rock was. And so they would be paid uh, so much uh, per phantom, six feet. So much per six feet or portion of six feet. And at the end of the contract period, which was typically two months, they would be paid. Uh, the, the tribute worker, what they were bidding on is what proportion of the ore they wanted to be paid. So if they knew they were in really rich ground, they could take a smaller proportion of the ore and know that they would come out all right. If it wasn't very good ground, they needed a larger proportion to come out well. And the miners knew the mine well enough, had been trained in the mines, knew enough uh, rudimentary geology, had their own sense of how rich the ground was to be able to make those judgments and make those um, uh, bids. And uh, so the tuck workers or the tribute uh, miners, they paid the cost of their, their tools, the cost of sharpening their tools too, they paid for their powder, their fuses, their candles, they paid for the expense of hoisting the ore. Uh, and uh, a lot of the mines had a doctor associated with it, like the mines here. <coughs> and so they paid something to keep the doctor on staff for the miners and, and their families. And, uh, and so just as a couple of exa uh, uh, examples, uh, type workers might be paid seven pounds for every six feet that they excavated. Um, and um, the tribute workers might, might get half of the value of the ore. And when they were mining tin, they actually got half the tin and they could go sell it themselves. When they were mining copper, the <coughs> copper got processed and they got cash. And then some contracts uh, paid them a subsistence, what the Cornish, uh, Cornish called cist. Um, but that wasn't the best for the Cornish miner. He could sometimes end up uh, getting so much in subsidies he had nothing left at the end of two months. What they most commonly did was had accounts at shops. And the shopkeepers were in on this and knew who the good miners were and who paid their bills, who the good Methodists were, singing in the choir and so forth. And so, so you had this bond between shopkeepers who were business owners and the miners themselves who were actually also uh, entrepreneurs. And so you see when you get to a place like Grass Valley and you have a big strike in 1869 over giant powder, you get this bond materializes not between the merchants and the mine owners, but between the merchants and the miners, because that's, that's where a more natural bond was. And so, um, here's a report to Parliament in uh, 1844. In the tribute system, uh, it, the tribute system, produces a degree of intelligence, independence, and rural and moral elevation, which raise the condition and character of the Cornish miner far above that of the generality of the laboring class. And so this is not a lot of baloney about you know a nose for a nose for copper or anything. This is the British Parliament, a committee out looking at the working the emerging working class around the United Kingdom and saying there's something different going on in Cornwall and these people uh, are in are in a little better condition a little better fed a little better health and it seems to have to do 
with this tribute system. And so uh, one of the men who went out and surveyed and studied the tribute system or the uh, tug work system, the contract system in uh, Cornwall said in 1842 when in England this really meant something, there's something American <laughs> about it. <laughs> and so just to show you there really is something American about it, this painting which I show repeatedly because I can't get over it, uh, painted by a Cornishman named uh, Bennett Opie, uh, who was a sort of a self-taught painter who, in Cornwall, and people saw he had talent and, and uh, he, he, he got training and moved on. But, so you have the man and the chair. You have the typical, the characteristic man in the chair. He used to be a king or an emperor now he's a lord or an owner. If you go to the Empire Mine and you walk in the visitor center, it's just a classic. William Bourne knew how to do the pose. <laughs> the man in the chair. And who looks down at you with sort of indifference. And, but here, the Cornish miner is looking him eye to eye and has his finger in his face. And so, uh, from this report in 1842, each man feels as a partner in his little firm, that is the par, in his little form, firm, that he meets his employer on nearly equal terms. And so that's part of the culture and the heritage that created the Cornish miner. And uh, so, part of the data that the Parliament was looking at when they were comparing this emerging uh, working class in, in different areas of England. The banks in Cornwall had over a quarter of a million pounds put there by uh, working people, people employed in mines mostly. And they discovered that <coughs> the my, a surprisingly high number of mine workers own their homes. I mean, what we would say own in their time, what was common, was a 99-year lease based upon the life of the youngest member of the family. But, but it's, it's as close as ownership uh, uh, was available. And so, what about the women? Were they getting a dose of this? Well, you betcha, because a lot of the women worked in the mines, and especially the smaller, undercapitalized mines who did not yet have the power equipment to pulverize ro rock. They employed women, known as ball maidens, uh, put them in a yard under a tent, and they had big hammers pounding away, breaking up the rock. And the ball maidens would maybe start, oh, maybe 13, 14 years old, and typically work until they were married. Sometimes married women would come back and work. Now look at these wall, wall maidens. H have you ever seen wider aprons? <laughs> okay, so not a work day. This is a Sunday go, go to Methodist Chapel day when this picture was taken. But a ball maiden could take home seven to 10 pounds of um, 